I'm Sarah Mangelsdorf, your provost and vice chancellor for academic affairs. For those of you I haven't met, and there are probably many, I've, I've been here a little over three months. It is a great pleasure to be with all of you here today. I could really feel the energy and excitement as I came, came to this event. Um, in fact, it's hard for us to get people to actually come in here because people are so excited to see one another and, and to talk. Um, Patrick Sims, our interim vice provost and chief diversity officer, asked me to say a few words this morning. And let me start by saying that I'm truly impressed by all that is going on here at UW-Madison when it comes to diversity and climate efforts. We seem to have many, many programs and services, but perhaps more impressive, it's very clear to me that there is a deep and heartfelt commitment to diversity and climate improvement here. It is important to me and to the institution as a whole, and I thank you all for all that you do on behalf of our students and our entire university community. I've been told that in past years, the prov provost often kicked off the diversity forum with PowerPoint slides detailing the status of our various diversity efforts, including information on student and staff diversity, faculty recruitment and retention, and student persistent and graduation rates. However, we've moved away from this approach in part because all of those data are available for you on the web. And for the purposes of the forum today, academic planning and institutional research has a display set up in the reception area just outside of Shannon Hall. I hope you will stop by, see their slides, and ask questions. I do want to share just a couple of highlights of good news according to some of their recent analyses. One is that the gap in first year retention rates is almost closed, so that's between our majority students and our underrepresented minority students. It used to be a big gap. It's now down to less than a percentage point. And when I say retention rates, we're talking about retaining students from freshman year to sophomore year. So it is 95.3% rate for students overall and 94.6% for underrepresented minority students. We'd like that to completely be gone when I'm here to talk to you next year, we'll see. The gap in our six-year graduation rates also narrowed this year, but it's, it's still a 12%, uh, 12 percentage point gap. However, within the past 10 years, this gap has been cut in half. It used to be 25 percentage points difference uh, 10 years ago. And that is the uh, difference. It used to be a graduation rate difference. Now it's currently 84.8% uh, graduation rate for all of our students in six years, 728 for our underrepresented minority students. So that's a good news, uh, bad news. There's still a lot of work to be done. And on the faculty front, the percentage of our faculty who are racial and ethnic minorities has increased by almost two percentage points in the last five years. So 18.7% of our faculty members our faculty of color. So those are good news. We have some good things to celebrate, but we also have some challenges too, and I think many of you are aware of what those are. I know many of you are focused and working on these challenges. We must do all we can to make UW-Madison welcome, welcoming to all of our students, our faculty and staff, regardless of race, gender, religion, and sexual orientation. We must continue to work on these issues. Patrick will come here in just a minute to give you more specifics about the forum today and tomorrow. He will also provide an update on the diversity framework, which is emerging out of the ad hoc diversity committee's report and recommendation. I want to close my remarks this morning by thanking all of you who worked so hard on the ad hoc diversity committee report, including many people who participated in listening sessions last year. This campus has an amazing tradition and culture of participation, unlike anything I've ever seen at any other university. And I'm very impressed with the positive impact that has on all that we do here. We are moving ahead with a number of positive initiatives, and we are affirming the good work that is already underway in many of your units, led by deans, directors, faculty, staff, and students. I hope the forum today and tomorrow spurs lots of new ideas and gives you opportunities to, to connect with one another and work on the challenges we have before us. Thank you all for coming. Patrick?
Good morning. Oh, come on now. If you've ever heard me speak or you've seen me get in front of a mic in front of an audience, I always do this. I ask good morning and I get kind of a half-hearted response and then I have to say, say good morning to me again like you mean it. So good morning. Good morning. Wow, there it is. I feel like I'm back in the classroom. Nobody wants to sit up front and talk to me, huh? <laughs> well, anyway, thank you, uh, Provost Mangelsdorf, uh, for your comments and giving us an update on our diversity in terms of numbers. Um, I encourage you all to continue to interact. If you haven't had a chance to hang out with Sarah, she's all right in my book. Uh, I'm glad that we're here. This is our 16th, 1-6, right? 16 years of our annual fall diversity forum. I think that deserves a round of applause, <laughs> right? 16 years we've been talking about diversity and climate and inclusion and trying to find what are the best practices and ways of moving forward and resetting the agenda to the point that it has an actual impact on our campus community. <clears throat> Since I've been in this role, we've moved to a new format, and our format is now a two-day format, one in which enables us to take a more inward focus on our own opportunity errors and success stories. Uh, that very much was the intention of the original forum as an outgrowth of Plan 2008, was to give an update. Uh, and we intend to give you that update, but much of that information, as the provost shared with you, is available online through our APIR website. Today, we're taking that inward focus, and tomorrow we're going to take that external focus. And we're doing things a little differently this time around. Uh, we're wanting to make sure we're able to have a robust conversation, uh, and we're able to really speak to the gray areas of some of the issues that we're facing on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm thrilled that that we're here and we're interested in continuing with the dialogue. <clears throat> One of the things I'd like to just uh, reiterate for us is that this is our campus-wide diversity event and it's, in, it's involved uh, from a reporting paradigm or structure that focuses just on stats and state of diversity to an orientation of proactive problem solving focused on learning about our global reality and seeking solutions together. This approach is more inclusive, in my opinion, and as we know from experience that reaching meaningful change through diversity is a shared responsibility. We all have a stake, <clears throat> excuse me, we all have a stake in the work and a role to play. Uh, and speaking of us each having a role to play, our new diversity framework reflects that right in its title, Forward Together. The plan replaces our 2008 plan, and it's different if you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, I encourage you to do so. Uh, this is indeed a true framework. So we aren't giving prescriptive ideas or specific timelines, we're asking folks to embrace the general concepts that are in the framework that will help shape on the ground conversations, right? Uh, conversations or experiences that you all know better than I do the solutions to address some of those challenges from your respective neck of the woods. We're trying to create that opportunity for all of us to engage in the conversation, not just the choir, right? We want all constituents involved in that conversation. So for much more detail and information about the plan and next steps, I encourage you to attend the session I'll be conducting tomorrow where I'll kind of walk you through uh, what we're up to, what we've accomplished to date, and what we intend to accomplish moving forward as we near the end of this particular academic year. Uh, that'll be tomorrow at 9.15 to 10.30 at the Pyle Center. So going back to day one, um, everything's happening in Shannon Hall for us today. Our first keynote will be Rebecca Ryan, described as a part futurist, part economist, who will help us think about the future of diversity at UW-Madison and beyond. Following Rebecca's talk, we'll have a faculty panel on stage to speak about the civil rights in the context of this being the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act. And I want to take a moment to applaud that. We had a, yeah. We had an amazing session this past spring, and it was so good, we had to repeat it, y'all. Uh, so we, we thought this would be the perfect opportunity to bring folks back to engage in this conversation. After that, there'll be a lunch break and food will be again served in Great Hall and Trip Commons. But because there are just so many of us here today, we had to break up lunch seating so it would be throughout the union in special designated rooms. Please refer to the map you picked up at the registration desk to guide you. But know there will always be members of my staff and team serving as ushers to help support you and guide you to those rooms. Following lunch, There'll be our second keynote speaker, Mr. Peter Aranda, who will talk to us about the business case for diversity. And finally, to wrap up the day, we'll have a town hall discussion with both the chiefs of police for Madison and our campus to discuss race, 
community, and law enforcement. Later this afternoon, I'll be back on stage to help moderate the conversation and give you the update on how tomorrow is going to work since we'll be in two locations. We'll be for the morning sessions in the Pile Center and then the afternoon session. We'll be in the Wisconsin Historical Society hearing a keynote from Major General Marsha Anderson, who is the only, the first and only African American uh, female to hold such a title for the United States Army Reserves. Following her speech, we'll hear final comments from Chancellor Blank, and then we're gonna close with a little reception, or as I like to say, a little party, right? Uh, have an opportunity to view a curated exhibit in the Historical Society, talking and focusing on our veterans and their role that they play in our campus. So lots, lots of things that are happening and going on for us. With that said, I just wanna transition to the intro for our first keynote speaker. We know it's Monday morning, uh, and this is the university, so we know what that means. It's time to go to school. Hold on to your coffee because we're gonna go right there with our first speaker. Data, it's the technical tool that separates scientists from someone with a hunch. How many of us have a few hunches out there about our diversity issues, right? Yeah, we need data. We, we know we love data here at this institution. <laughs> the fodder for interpretation by po politicians and opinion writers are hunches, but most often it's the scary ingredient most would like to avoid, but we know there is some value and truth in those hunches. This morning's keynote speaker doesn't have any form of number phobia. In fact, it's where she lives as a futurist, economist, and a specialist in trends and their impact. But Rebecca goes even further. She adds people to the mix, and that's what I like, the people part. People and their social attitudes, political policies, and how all of it impacts the reality we live in from procreation to the economy, to economically engineered social stratification that we sometimes try and deny. Yeah, she's going to focus and talk about all of that. She's candid, edgy, insightful, and in pointing out that if you can identify a trend, you can also track what or who is driving it. And she might point at you. I know she pointed at me just before I came out, but that's OK, right? She's definitely a voice we need to hear in our diversity work. And I'm thrilled that she's going to be with us this morning, sharing her thoughts and insights. So please, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome with me Ms. Rebecca Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. I know you probably didn't have this experience of Vice Provost Sims when he was up here, but that man smells fantastic. <laughs> um, I hope he is hanging out backstage just so I can be around that. How are you this morning? Good. We're going to have some weather this week. Uh, if you are from uh, any place south, I'm sorry. Um, I want to hit three big beats for you this morning. Vice Provost Sims said we're going to look inward today, and that's really where I want to go. I mean, I'm going to talk about some trends, but at the end of the day, it comes right back to here. So the three big beats I want to hit for you today, first, that America is seasonal, and my argument is that we're in a wintertime period right now. I mean, not just thermally, we're feeling like it's winter, but societally and economically, we're in a wintertime period. And I want to talk about the stewardship of what that means. The second beat that I want to hit, and I knew it was Monday, so um, I brought 14 trends and I numbered them all. So it'll be easy to just follow along, because I saw how practical many of your shoes are, so I know you're list makers. Um, <laughs> So I brought a list of 14 trends that I think are either going to hit the crosshairs of UW-Madison, are going to hit Madison, might hit your families, um, and, but will certainly probably hit where you're from if, in fact, you plan to call the U.S. home at any point in the near future. And as a futurist, I'll tell you the reason I think trends matter is because trends become, start as sort of weak signals. That's what we call them in the business. They start as weak signals. But if you can get out ahead, and start thinking through the impacts of these trends, you will be future ready. So that's the second beat, these 14 trends. And then the third beat I want to share with you today is uh, in June, my last monthly column for Madison Magazine was called Dear White People. Some of you saw this. Uh, it took me 47 revisions and six months of writing to sort of come out as a white person living in the most racist city and the most racist county and the most racist state in the U.S. And um, if you're Caucasian, I strongly encourage you to tune into that 
last beat. Um, because I do think it starts with the conversation. And as white people, we have been complicit. So, are you ready? Three beats. Wow, we had a couple shouters. Awesome. <laughs> I was not expecting that this morning. So first beat, right? America is seasonal. America goes through these spring, summer, fall, winter seasons, and they happen on a cycle to, in their totality, spring, summer, fall through winter, about 80 to 100 years, right? So just to bring us up to speed on this current season and to think about um, kind of where we are in the cycle, I want to take you through our most recent seasons. Spring came to America immediately after World War II. Our economy was doing what China's economy is doing today. The middle class was exploding, just exploding, right? And just to give you one little data point that I think we can identify with in light of having just, well, economists say we're through the Great Recession. A lot of us don't feel that way. But um, in light of the Great Recession, just to give you one data point, after World War II, when World War II was ending, the U.S. Congress decided to pass the GI Bill. The GI Bill was basically a way to make sure that our soldiers who were repatriating after fighting overseas could come back and they could get into college, they could buy homes, right? They could sort of start living this American dream. And we were able to bring nearly 12 million soldiers back, and we did not hit the cap on that GI Bill. So to give you a sense of how quickly the economy was growing, to be able to absorb 12 million folks coming back into the economy, it's pretty remarkable. In fact, uh, I have a friend, Kevin Turco, he lives in San Francisco, and he talks about these like amazing things that might happen sometimes. He calls them rainbow unicorns, right? Like, you think they might exist, but you're really not sure. This period in America's history was a rainbow unicorn. Jim Collins, a little more serious than Kevin Turco, Jim Collins, the guy who's written Good to Great, Built to Last, and other bestsellers with three words in the title. Um, <laughs> He refers to this period in America on par with the rise of the Roman Empire and the, the, you know, the Greek Empire. He said, this is a moment we may never again see in our lifetimes, this springtime period in the U.S., right? So, um, anybody born during this era? These are baby boomers, right? Baby boomers who were born during spring and came of age during summer. Right? Summer was about 65 through 80, and summer is a time when one generation looks at backwards at everything that's happened to date and says, aw, huh, uh right? So baby boomers who were coming of age during this era, they said, why don't women get paid what men get paid? Why don't they have the same opportunities? Women would be just as good of doctors, attorneys, professors as men would be. They looked at uh, things like, what is it about civil rights? Why are African Americans sitting in different parts of the lunch counter, different parts of the bu what is that about, right? And they also said, why are we putting waste into our water, into our lakes, into our oceans? Boomers started three major social revolutions during this summertime period. Women's rights, civil rights, and the environmental movement. Right? That happened on the baby boomers' watch. Who was born during summer? Anybody in here born during summer? Right on. You're my Gen Xers. You're my Gen Xers. Why are we called Gen Xers? Because the media couldn't come up with any other label to describe us. <laughs> a tiny little bit of trivia. Doug Copeland did write a book in the 19, late 1980s, I think it was, called Generation X, and a lot of people think, oh, Copeland named us, huh? -uh. Actually, the original Generation X was a band that Billy Idol started before Rebel Yell became popular. Um, but Gen Xers are born during summer and came of age during fall right? Came of age during a time when there were purportedly razor blades and Halloween candy, when there were missing children on milk cartons, the shuttle Challenger exploded. At that time, we were spending far more time with our teachers than we were with our parents. That made a big difference to us. The nuclear family exploded. The divorce rate skyrocketed during this era, and for the first time that anybody could remember, headlines in newspapers said things like, Japanese student scores eclipse American student scores in math and science. STEM has its roots there, right? The Skills 2000 educational initiative has its roots here as America started to lose its stability and its competitive advantage. And what literally happened from sort of a macro perspective is the rest of the world just caught up. Right? Europe was decimated after World War II. Japan decimated after World War II. It took two generations, but they rebuilt. They got back up. 
and America lost its relative advantage, right, relative to these other countries. And this is fall in America, and um, this is the time when we had our Gen Xers were growing up, and they were our first generation of latchkey kids. This is now a, uh, a term that millennials and the I generation has no idea what it means, but were any of you latchkey kids? Right, okay, so what that means is, your parents weren't home after school, you wore a key around, in my case, it was a tennis shoe string, uh, around your neck so that you could let yourself in the house after work because mom and dad weren't home. This is the time, this is the era when call waiting was established because mom was trying to call you, but you were on a cell phone the size of like a water pitcher, right? You were a mobile phone. Remember those first like handheld phones that took two hands, right? You were on the phone with your chums from school and mom was trying to get through to tell you like put the pork chops in the oven or you know, whatever the case was. Um, so as Gen Xers were coming of age, they were really taught to rely on themselves and not to trust anybody. We got education on stranger, yes, stranger danger. I remember in my school, it was like a tiny little guidance counselor and she had a mustache. She was always slightly frightening, right? And she came in and did the stranger danger uh, curriculum, don't trust anybody. So you can see where fall, the sense of security, the nuclear family, exploding stranger danger curriculum, this is where helicopter parenting started that we know so well today, right? Who in here was born during fall? Yeah, right now you're thinking, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks a lot, mom and dad, because you're coming of age in winter. Winter started in 2001 when two planes hit the World Trade Centers, World Trade Center buildings, two other planes went down. By 2002, our long-running bull market crashed. Wall Street freaked out. But the brainiacs on Wall Street figured out other ways to make money. That led to what we now know as the mortgage meltdown, right? By 2008, when um, banks were going belly up and our unemployment started to skyrocket in this country, it was like a series of icky dominoes were just falling one on top of the other. And this is winter in America. It's just a feeling of yuck. Now, I guess it's good news. We've been through three of these wintertime periods. We've been through, we're entering our fourth full cycle right now. The three previous wintertime periods were the American Revolution, Civil War and Reconstruction, and the Great Depression, right? Now, the kind of the dirty little trick, as I mentioned earlier, is that our meat suits, right? These things only last like 80 years. Right? We never see two winters. So every time winter comes again, we think, oh my goodness, we've never been through this. And we have never been through this, but we have been through this. Right? And when I wrote my last book, Regeneration, I wanted America's next generation to know that we've been here before. And we can do it again, because the promise of winter, you know, this looks terrible. This is a photograph. This is a tree in my backyard, not from this morning, from a couple winters ago, right? But especially when you show this photograph to people in the south, they think, oh my god, that tree, did it die? It didn't die. What happens during winter up here? They hi things hibernate, right? We pull the energy in. We pull the energy out from the extremities, we pull it in, we reassess, we reconfigure, we regenerate, because when spring comes again, it's gonna take all that energy to burst forth. Every time America has been through a wintertime period, we have emerged as a country that works better for more people. Every time. That is winter's promise, potential, and that's our stewardship. For those of us sitting in this room who are breathing oxygen today, we have a responsibility to set the table for the next generation that will inherit our coming spring. Spring will come again. But whether we are a country that is reaching further into its potential or not is based on the decisions we make during this period. It's interesting because every previous wintertime period has had a generation that's been considered a lost generation, right? When I went back and did some research on the Great Depression and the Civil War era, right, look back on these lost generations. You know, just to put this in perspective for you, during the Great Depression, our lost generation were the quarter of a million kids who rode rail cars from city to city looking for work. 250,000 teenagers were bumming around the country on rail cars looking for work, emaciated, hungry,
disconnected from their families, disconnected from social structure. That was a lost generation. Well, ironically, a few years ago, AARP, yes, the American Association for Retired Persons, asked the next generation, 20-somethings, right, the millennials at the time, they said, where do you think the world is going to be? Where do you what do you think your life is going to be like 30 years hence, 30 years from now? And one of the finalists, Jonathan Reed, did this piece that I want to show you now, and he called it The Lost Generation. And I want you to hang in here with this, because there's a twist. I am part of a lost generation, and I refuse to believe that I can change the world. I realize this may be a shock, but happiness comes from within is a lie, and money will make me happy. So in 30 years, I will tell my children they are not the most important thing in my life. My employer will know that I have my priorities straight because work is more important than family. I tell you this, once upon a time, families stayed together, but this will not be true in my era. This is a quick fix society. Experts tell me, 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. I do not concede that I will live in a country of my own making. In the future, environmental destruction will be the norm. No longer can it be said that my peers and I care about this earth. It will be evident that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It is foolish to presume that there is hope. And all of this will come true unless we choose to reverse it. There is hope. It is foolish to presume that my generation is apathetic and lethargic. It will be evident that my peers and I care about this earth. No longer can it be said that environmental destruction will be the norm. In the future, I will live in a country of my own making. I do not concede that 30 years from now, I will be celebrating the 10th anniversary of my divorce. Experts tell me this is a quick fit society but this will not be true in my era. Family stayed together once upon a time. I tell you this, family is more important than work. I have my priorities straight because my employer will know that they are not the most important thing in my life. So in 30 years, I will tell my children, money will make me happy is a lie and happiness comes from within. I realize this may be a shock, but I can change the world and I refuse to believe that I am part of a lost generation. So our 20-somethings, our next generation, they know that there's a lot at stake in this moment. And my invitation to you, to all of us who are making it through this winter, is that it is not enough to be smart. We must also be wise. Which means that sometimes we're going to have to sacrifice present payoff for future payoff, right? It's almost as if at every decision-making table, there should be an eight-year-old sitting there, right? An eight-year-old, the kid who is going to inherit the next spring, right? Just as a proof of conscience, right? Just as a voice for a future generation. So, um, futuring, the work that I do, strategic foresight, I can't think of a more important moment than this one to be wise about what is coming. So with that, are you ready? Should we start talking about what spring is possibly going to look like? You ready? Ready? Okay, let's do it. 14 trends. How are we going to get to spring? What's it going to look like? Well, how, are there any bakers in here, people who love to bake bread? Bread bakers, it's Madison, right? Okay. So, <laughs> bread recipes, traditional, there's like a standard bread recipe, and it only has a few ingredients. Bakers, tell me what they are. Let's shout them out. Flour, right. Wow, everybody start with that one. Good. What else? Yeast, Yeast. good. Water, or some sort of a liquid, maybe an egg or whatever, right? What else? A little bit of salt, and does anybody have a fifth that they really love? Sugar, okay, yeah, a little sugar for those of you who, right, don't have a low glycemic index. That's awesome. Um, yes, 
Those are the, the basic things. And if you know the master bread recipe, you can improvise, right? So you do a different kind of flour, or maybe you swap the oil for the egg, right? Or a little bit of water, whatever it is. Master bread recipe. This right here, steep. This is the futurist's master bread recipe for scanning for trends. Steep, and you know, people call it different things. You can add different acronyms, but this is for me. Society, technology, economy, environment, politics. This for me is the bread recipe that I take in when I'm trying to understand the future of an environment, the future of a domain. So I'm gonna share with you trends from four of these areas. I'm leaving technology out, not because I'm not in love with it, it just doesn't feel completely germane and rooted in this conversation about, uh, about diversity. So let's go. Let's start with society. Here are some of my favorite trends. Some of these are obvious as a ham sandwich, and other of these are weak signals, things that are just starting to bubble up, but we're seeing more and more and more of them, right? So the first one, the rise of women, right? The rise of women is happening today, like here, it was two election cycles ago now, in, in 12, largest class of women we had ever elected to uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives in the United States. Largest class ever. And then in the upper right-hand corner are how women's jobs, in pink, rebounded more quickly than men's jobs, in blue, right? The reason I share this with you is because in the 1980s, something significant happened that set the table for this. In the 1980s, the force of America's economy shifted from manufacturing and what you could lift to the information age and what you could think through and knowledge, right? Peter Drucker called it the knowledge-based economy. And when that happened, the table was reset for women. So right now, in many, most of our urban, large metropolitan centers, women who are 25 years old are out-earning men who are 25 years old. You know here at the UW, right, we've got more women than men um, graduating with a lot of advanced degrees. The U.S. Census tells us that 60% of all jobs classified as management and supervision are held by women, right? So what happens when women start reaching parity with men, right? Not just in the kinds of jobs, but in, the, in pay and so forth. Well, your family starts to change. It starts to change quite a bit. I checked into the Westin in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and saw this sign for men's divorce school in the Seneca room. Men's divorce school, right? And this was too good to pass up, right? <laughs> so... So later on, when men's divorce school was scheduled to start, I just kind of loitered in the hallways of the Westin to see what was going on, right? And first of all, it was a bunch of dudes in seed corn caps, right? So a lot of pioneers, you know, so forth. And it was packed. It was like this whole area was packed. And there's a law firm on the East Coast that specializes in making sure men don't act a fool during their divorces, that they don't inadvertently shoot themselves in the foot. In fact, they have a book that they were selling in the back of the room called, like, 89 Stupid Things Men Do to Screw Up Their Divorce, right? So um, this was really interesting to me. This is very interesting to me. But when you start looking at what's underneath this, right, here's the statistic. Two-thirds of all divorces initiated among baby boomers are initiated by women, right? So if you're going to get married at all, and we'll talk about that trend in just a second, right? If you're going to get married at all, there is a sense that it better be a marriage of equals, right? That it better be a situation where each partner can fulfill their, you know, their potential. This one is actually scaring me half to death because this is right around the corner. By 2017, half of all kindergartners will be children of single parents. Our forms at school are not even set up for this, right? Parent one, parent two. Right? With the assumption that they have the same address. There aren't two different address sections in these elementary school forms. And then, just think through, what does that mean for aftercare? What does that mean for summer for kids? Right? And what does it mean for our workplaces? Right? It's quickly going to become the best workplaces in America will quickly recognize this right? and make a place around this for parents who need a ton of flexibility, but also for kids right? who need some structure. Fourth trend, this notion of adulthood. Dr. Daryl Davis Fulmer, who was at uh, Madison College for a while, and I think she's now back in Milwaukee. Some of you probably know Daryl. She, um, her sisters were on the cover of Life magazine. Uh, they were among the first African-American kids to be segregated in the South during civil rights. So, um, Daryl has always been a touchstone for me. And we were talking about this notion of adulthood because Daryl has three, two Gen Xers and a millennial. So they're in their like 
at the time she told me this story, they were like in their mid-30s to late 20s. And she was really excited because the previous uh, Christmas, all of her kids had come home for the holidays, and they came, brought their significant others, and there was one grandbaby. And she said, we took up a whole pew at church, right? So Daryl's anchoring one end of the pew, and her husband's anchoring the other end of the pew. And for some reason, the minister's standing behind the podium that day, and he said uh, something along the lines of, uh, Moses left home at 40, and Jesus left home at 30. And Daryl looked down her pew, and she said, we are going for Jesus. (laughs) (laughs) Because like other baby boomer and slightly older parents, right, Kids are on some sort of assistance. 60% of all kids in their 20s get some sort of assistance from their parents, right? And they're having a tough time making it uh, through school in four years. Some of them don't want to because the job market is scary right now. So these gates of adulthood, which you will recognize, right? Moving out of the house, finishing school, getting a job, getting married, starting a family. They're just starting differently. So moving out of the house. It's cool now for millennials to live with their parents. Right? Gen Xers, just put the letter on your forehead of what you were if you moved back home with your parents. Let me see it. That's right. L for loser. Loser, right? But for the millennial generation, they're BFFs with their parents, right? They're pals with their parents. I can't tell you how many parents are like, I don't really like Facebook, but if I want to keep in touch with my kid, it's where I have to be, right? Um, So Parents and children have a significantly different relationship now. Boomers are among the best parents that we've ever had, right? You're welcome. Yes, congratulations to you. Um, (laughs) Finishing school. My godson Avery, he would hate it if he knew. He is in his seventh year of a four-year program at UW-Green Bay. And he recently confided to me that he is that guy on campus now. That creepy older guy who's... (laughs) who's still at school, right? Uh, Tough to get a job. Millennials are among the the most underemployed and unemployed generation. Getting married, I'm going to show you a slide on this in just a second, but, uh, and starting a family. Because we're getting married later, has all kinds of repercussions for for fertility, right? And so many, many, many Gen Xers, millennials, the I generation, they have pets first. Does anybody in here have a grand dog? Yes. All right. Proudly, proud, proudly. Okay, good. Because you're going to have to settle for that because of this. I went to Wikipedia, the source of all truth. I just want to point this out. So this is the America's average age of a first marriage for men, for women. Canada, 31 for men, 29 for women. U.S., 29 for men, 27 for women. Peru, cougar nation, baby. Look at that. Men are 26. The women are 31. Right? Just saying. I'm just saying. That's just the Americas. You can see here, right? Asia, 32 for men, 29 for women. Adulthood is being pushed back globally. Globally. So what does that mean? What does that mean for what we think about stability? What does that mean for what we think about um, family? Right? Fifth trend. Here you go. More Americans are living alone. So sometimes developers come to me and say, Rebecca, we want to do a next generation housing development. What should we do? And I say, 900 square feet with one awesome bedroom, an enormous closet, if you want to hit the female target, and high-end finishing, right? And they walk away like, you know, my head melted to goo, right? But when you look at the trends around living alone longer, people being happier about that. What's happening with our elders, elders are totally playing into this demographic, right? This kind of trend towards living alone. It's all right there, sixth trend. (sighs) We don't have a generation gap anymore. And boomers, by the way, want to thank you because it was as you guys were coming of age during the summertime period that the term generation gap emerged because your parents looked at you like you were crazy, right? They didn't recognize you. What do you mean you're sitting in, right? (laughs) I remember my my dad, who was a World War II vet, um, he really, really, really badly wanted to help my cousin Tim, who was a moccasin-wearing, fly-collar, medallion-wearing, pot-smoking hippie. Um, Dad really wanted to help him get a job at a manufacturing company where my dad worked. So he kind of, you know, helped Tim get an interview, and Tim got hired. But then my dad had to supervise Tim. And... um, (laughs) My dad, who is super religious, who would not say shit if his mouth was full of it, (laughs) 
came home from the first week of work and was like, God damn, Tim, you know, and it just went on from there. You're not supposed to wear bell bottoms in a manufacturing environment because that stuff can get caught in a machine, right? You're supposed to wear steel-toed boots, not like these moccasins without socks, right? <laughs> Cut your hair, Tim. That doesn't look, all of this, on and on and on. So the generation gap, right, that's baby boomers invented that because you honked your parents off so much that they felt there was a huge gap between you and everyone else. Well, what we have right now, what we are facing right now, is a cultural generation gap. We don't have a generation gap. I mean, when you ask any 20-something on campus, what matters most to you? And you contrast that with any 60-year-old, right? Two generations older than them, what matters most to you? They're going to say things like family, right? My community. They're going to give you the same, very similar list of things. So there's no generation gap in terms of values. What there is now is a cultural generation gap because 98% of our population growth between 2000 and 2010 in our largest cities came from growth in Latinas, African Americans, Asian Americans. 83% of our overall population growth as a country came from these same demographics. So the, you know, we're very quickly becoming a nation of older, white, very well cared for folks, and younger, browner, largely ignored younger folks, right? Thank you. And what's going to happen here, I mean, think this through. What's going to happen when we have a nation of folks, and my mom, who's 87 years old, she is the epitome of this, right? Inez. Inez feels like she has all these entitlements coming to her, which I think is fantastic, except the check that was written for her can't be cashed right now, because we are in winter. That check was written in spring. It can't be cashed in winter. It can't. It simply can't. So if we can't get our older white populations to understand that our next generation, who might not look like them, is the future of our country, it's going to be a cold day. It's going to be a colder winter. Perfect example of this. And I, and I don't want to give you the impression that this is a lost cause. But let me share a quick story with you. I was invited to Atlanta to do um, a talk for a series of groups, but one of the groups was philanthropists. And you know the definition of philanthropists are people so rich, right, that they can give money away. <laughs> so I was talking about the cultural generation gap, and I was talking about the future of education, I was talking about the future of America's competitiveness, and I introduced this concept of social security reform. Like, here was the concept I introduced, super confrontational concept. I said, what if people like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett just didn't get Social Security? What if Social Security was really reserved for people who needed it? Right? I'm talking to philanthropists. Elderly woman came up to me. I, I don't know if she was elderly, but she's, she looked like she was in her 80s. And she was wearing like this fantastic suit with a brooch that was amazing. And um, she shook my hand and she did the, she did the hand and the hand over, you know? Because in the, this is the South, right? This is the South. And she said to me in her salty Southern accent, she said, Rebecca, I really enjoyed your talk. But if you try to touch my social security, you will have trouble. I know that this woman gives millions of dollars away. And she gives it away in the directions that I would give it away if I had millions of dollars. I know her heart is in the right place for the legacy she wants to leave, but there's this one part of her heart that doesn't get the whole picture, right? So how do we move in this cultural generation gap environment? How do we move more people to seeing the totality of the picture? Seventh trend, these are all going to be economy. I told you I'm going to skip technology, so if you're following steep, like I know some of you are, eight types, right? I skipped the T for technology. We're going straight to the economy. In my last book, when I was talking about the future of America, I talked about the seasonal stuff, but then I, I framed it around six key questions that I think America needs to get right if we're going to become that country that once again works better for more people, if we're going to keep the promise and the, and the potential of winter. 
And one of the six questions is, does the middle class matter? Because I have to tell you, you know, we just came through this election cycle. I feel like the middle class gets thrown around like bait on a line, right? Just to hook us, right? Like, ooh, middle class, mm, middle class, right? So what is the middle class? I found out there is no definite, I thought I was going to find out the middle class is households who earn between X and Y. Mm -mm, no. The middle class in this country is based on families' ability to meet a series of aspirations. You know what they are? Let's think about it. Yeah, to be able to afford your home. What's it, what would be another one? Yes, can I send my kids to college? Another one. Yes, can I afford to go on vacation? Can I afford to retire? No. Well, probably it is now, right? <laughs> Yes, maybe being able to, but being able to afford your own health care, right? And I think sometimes that gets a little bundled in with retirement. So when I learned that the middle class is really about being able to achieve aspirations, it made a lot of sense to me. Because when you think about, I'm sorry, this is a little bit faint, but the red or what probably looks like a pink or fuchsia line um, is productivity, right? Just productivity continues to go up and up. We get a lot of crap done in this country. We do. You all work so hard, right? But then about the 1970s, median family income continued to rise overall, but it tapered off a little bit. And what this shows is there really hasn't been an equal distribution of productivity gains to everyone. You know, this, the 1% is not bullshit, right? This is actually true. So what we then know is that if we look at how income has grown on the left here, right, two-parent, right, two kids and then one parent, two kid families, 20%, 21% between 90 and 2008. I don't want to geek out on you too much, but this is where the rubber hits the road. On the right are the costs of some of the middle class aspirations. This explains it, doesn't it? Right? It's not that not everybody, it's just that it, being middle class has become a lot more expensive. A lot more expensive. So do we still have a middle class? Yes. Right? Is it harder? Mm-hmm. Yes, it is. So eighth thing here, I want to talk a little bit about what happens when we don't have a middle class, right? I mean, the definition of having a strong middle class is that everyone is more or less equal. More or less on the same, you know, can afford the same things. When there's less of a middle class, that means there's bigger bubbles on the ends. More people with a lot of wealth or a concentration of wealth and more people who aren't in the middle class, right? So this is what's happened in our country is we've just kind of hollowed out the bell curve, right? And turned it into a dumbbell, right? So what happens? Amazing research done by two British public health officials, Wilkins and Pickett, called the spirit level. I could show you 50 charts about this stuff. I only pick two. But this is what happens with trust. In more equal US states, level of, levels of trust are higher. Right? And here is, and I don't think it really matters, but there's Wisconsin right there, not doing too badly. But Wisconsin hardly matters, because I'm sure that here, not everybody is from here. In fact, let me just do a quick poll. Every community has three kinds of people. Homegrowns, people who have lived here their whole lives, right? Boomerangers, people who couldn't wait to get out of here. They're like, see you, Wisconsin, but who the strong sucking sound just pulled you back in <laughs> over time, right? And the third kind of folks are transplants. These are people who like, Wisconsin, where is that? Or Madison, what? Right? You never knew where it was. You lived your whole life somewhere else, but now you're here probably for love or money, right? And we're not proud, we'll take you. Right? So, real quickly, how many of you have lived in Scani your whole lives? Let me see it. All right. How many of you are boomerangers? You grew up here, but you could not wait to get out, and then you, whew, the sucking sound brought you back. Right? Okay. Transplants. Look at you, transplants. All right. It's pretty equal. We should have like a three way tug of war. Uh. <laughs> oh. So, so it's maybe less important about what Wisconsin's number is overall, where they fall on this, but it is important to note that trust and inequality are correlated. It's important to note that health and social problems are correlated. It's important to know that public safety and um, inequality are correlated. It's important to know that childhood obesity and um, infant mortality and death rate and death age are all correlated. Higher the inequality, the more profound these impacts are in your community. So does the middle class matter? It matters a lot. And no less than Republican Mitch Daniels spoke to CPAC, which is the big Republican PAC, Right? And he said, by any fair reading of the facts, 
Our country is not helping people get their foot on the first rung of the economic ladder. People like Mitch Daniels need a giant smoochy kiss on the side of their face, right? Because that is the truth. And if we don't help more people get their foot on the first rung of the economic ladder, there's no way they're going to get their foot on the second rung. And this has been almost now insidious for over two generations. Ninth trend. Ooh, I love this one. You hear a lot of the next gen members of the next generation talk about social E. Any of you taken a social E class, social entrepreneurship or social innovation? Anybody? Oh, dear. Okay, well, <laughs> maybe when I speak at the business school, that'll be different. But the reason I bring this up, social entrepreneurship, is because the next generation is breaking a few of our economic paradigms, a few of our societal paradigms, and one that I am totally stoked about, this organization, Hand Up, in the upper left-hand corner there. Hand Up is a bunch of 20 and 30-somethings in the San Francisco, they started in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm sure you've heard that San Francisco and New York are having these, you know, just huge, the cost of housing, it's like not a place where anybody except the very wealthy can afford to live. These 20 and 30-somethings were kind of honked off about that. They're trying to think, like, what can we do? What can we do? So they started a for-profit company. This is a for-profit company, hand up. And what they do is panhandlers who are on the streets of San Francisco asking you for money, they say, you know, would you like a different way to get funded whatever it is you need to get funded? So if I am a person who does not have a home, I say, yeah, sign me up for hand up. And they come and they take my photograph. And they get my story. Why am I on the street? What do I need money for? And which agency is working with me? So that information goes on a little business card, my business card, and I can hand that out to people instead of having my hand out to people. And then with a QR code reader, you can look at what my story is, why I'm on the street, what I need the money for, and right there, make a contribution that goes to an agency that will ensure that my need is met. Can you see how this is going to blow up United Way? You know, we have, wanted, we have wanted agencies to proxy for us. Maybe dealing with these issues was a little too complex. Maybe dealing with these you know, inequalities in our community felt a little messy. And agencies have, have gladly, and many have done a terrific job of playing this intermediary. But then you've got a couple of people who don't care. And who say, what if we could just do it directly? I want to know your story. I want to know your whole story. I want to know it in a more meaningful way. And this is the notion of direct philanthropy. And I, I just want to underscore, this is a for-profit company, right? This isn't trying to just a bunch of do-gooders. And I think that's an important thing, just because it blows up the model. It blows up the model. Let's talk a little bit about the 10th trend, this idea of open innovation. What happens when companies just ask anybody to help them build something better, faster, cheaper. Netflix said, we need an algorithm for movie recommendations. Right? We're going to give, I think it was a million dollars, we're going to give a million dollars away for anybody who can develop a better algorithm for movie recommendations. And these teams got together, you know, these people who are in the nerd circus, right? They got together, and they're brainstorming these algorithms, and then the two teams found out about each other. And they were terrified that like, the other team was going to win. And this is a big pot of money. So they said, what if we just all got together? We sew up that million dollars. We put the best of our technology with the best of your technology. And if you have a Netflix subscription and you have been happy with your algorithm, that was designed by people who didn't work at Netflix. Right? Boeing has done the same thing. They needed a lighter, a lighter um, nut for one of their screws. Boeing uses a lot of nuts, OK? Right? They needed a lighter nut, and they said, let's play with this open innovation thing. So they put out a $10,000 prize. It was open to anybody. They said, we need a, a nut that meets these components, but it has to be less than this weight, and you know, ba 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 ba. And a team of three kids from two different universities won the 10K. And Boeing was like, that's great. But what Boeing really loved is it took six weeks. If they had shot that through their R&D department, you know, their R&D department is like, we're working on thermodynamics and how wings respond to wind. And, you know, if, a nut, not such a high priority, right? So this notion of opening the doors of innovation, how do we hack our curriculums? How do we um, hack City Hall, right? How do we make this a place where more people are thinking about problems? Eleventh trend, the sharing economy. Whew, Deb Archer, who works for the Convention and Visitors Bureau here, she's working so hard to make sure that we can keep Uber and Lyft. Right? Um, but the sharing economy brought to us largely by the next generation who's living in a completely new economic model. And um, just to get you inside the mindset on this trend, 
a 20-something woman said to me, Rebecca, I do not want to own a drill, but sometimes I need a hole. Do you have a drill in your garage? You use it, I mean, unless you're like super carpenter guy or gal. Exactly. You hardly use it, right? So the Oakland Public Library has picked up on this. Oakland, California is an area where there's a lot of urban gardening happen, happening. So in addition to being able to take your library card and check out a book, you can also take your library card and check out a rototiller. You can check out a lawnmower, electric or gas. You can check out a lot of that really heavy and expensive gardening equipment and just bring it back with a full tank and they'll do the maintenance and they'll do the service on it. Amazing, right? The sharing economy. An amazing way that institutions are reinventing themselves. Twelfth trend, the environment. I know I'm sitting here with a bunch of enviros, but um, I'm often not. <laughs> a planning student at UT Arlington where a lot of great planners have come from ask this great question. At what point do cities without a sustainability plan just cease to exist, right? Because our next generation has seen the heat map. They have seen planetary warming. This is NASA's heat map going back to the 1885, goes through 2010. Here we are in the Great Depression, World War II, post-World War II, right? Here we are, summer love, Reagan. <laughs> okay, so you show this map to any age of, to any 20-somethings, right? And they know that that map's going to be orange on their watch. They know that they are inheriting a crap sandwich when it comes to the environment. And even if you don't agree, this is Hurricane Sandy. This is Hurricane Sandy taken from outer space. Looks kind of big, yeah. Um, here it is on the ground. This is the 100-foot bathtub ring around Lake Mead, the Hoover Dam. 100-foot bathtub ring. And Texas is now in its 13th year of drought. 13th year of drought. Eric Ness just wrote an article for Milwaukee Magazine about the future of water in Wisconsin. So this isn't just happening in southern states. This is happening here as well. Um, our natural resources, our environment are completely imperiled. And if you don't believe the science of this, maybe the money will talk. Because this is the 13th trend, right? American Family is right here in our backyard. And the actuaries at American Family who predict things like, you know, based on my age and weight and my health history, they will tell me when I'm gonna die. Thanks, American Family. Um, but this is how they budget for all their actuarial tables, right? For my health insurance or my life insurance and whatnot. Well, they also do commercial coverage, right? Trying to predict, like, if a twister's gonna hit my house or what's gonna happen with any, you know, physical infrastructure that they insure. And what American families, actuaries, are freaked out about right now is there is no predictability to this. This is not a statistical um, bit that makes sense to actuaries. 20 of the 30, 67% of the most expensive insured disasters have happened since 2001, right? That doesn't make any sense. Their tables are blowing up. When um, David Beckham announced, David Beckham, sexy international soccer star, you know, married to one of the Spice Girls, right? Um, so now he's in Miami, he's like doing his thing in Miami. And um, he announced recently that they are going to build a soccer stadium on the, at the port of Miami, and it's gonna hold 25,000 people. So the basketball fans in Miami were PO'd, because they're like, <laughs> 25,000 people, that's bigger than the Miami Heat Stadium. So you know it's about who's bigger, right? I'll stop there. <laughs> um, when I read that headline, my first thought as a futurist was like, who's going to insure that? Who is going to insure a 25,000-person arena on the port of Miami? It is going to be an aquarium in 20 years, right? Who is going to insure that, David Beckham? Who is on your board of advisors? <sighs> so it's getting more expensive. And the final trend here, politics. Lord. <laughs> if you are frustrated with politics, I want to just tell you that politics is always a lagging indicator as we turn from any season to the next. It's always a lagging indicator. Okay? So... Um, and this, this image is the best image 
that I think captures the true zeitgeist of the American people. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> um, Valerie said it wasn't church, but that just at that moment, it sort of felt like it. Um, you know, Americans just feel like, I mean, you saw some of the exit polling, right? Like, people are really honked off with Obama's leadership, but they feel like Congress is doing an even worse job, you know? So there's, there's no good juju going around in this space right now. And the reason is because the very infrastructure, our two-party system, is not set up for pissed off, right? We have to pick a side. We have to pick a side. And these red and blue maps that were flying around on Wednesday, as a futurist, as an economist, they just honk me off. Because it doesn't tell the story. It tells the either or story. It doesn't tell that story. Because 51% of us are in the middle. The majority of us are in the middle. You love Jesus and you go to church, but you love your gay children. And you do not want to have to choose. You go to NASCAR. You love fast cars, crashes, and Daytona Beach, right? For all the reasons, but you expect to recycle your beer bottles and cans when you're on those grounds, <laughs> right? So this either or dynamic is a false start. It is a false start. So if you were upset about the politics, right, I don't want you to relax because we have to agitate. We do. Right? Winter to spring belongs to all of us. But I also want you to know that this is going to be a lagging indicator for us, not a leading indicator for us. Those are 14 trends. Did you get them all? Awesome. Okay. The last thing I want to talk about is this article, Dear White People. So, um, as you can see, whoops, as you can see in just a minute, I had to go into the witness protection program after I wrote this article. <laughs> um, <laughs> this has been on my heart. I've lived in Madison for a decade now. And uh, I'll tell you something I've never told another audience. I'm adopted. And uh, my adoptive parents, Elmer and Inez, uh, are very proudly right-wing cons Christian conservatives. And um, when their daughter, at 26, came out as a lesbian, it did not, it did not help their heart, right? <laughs> and it got bad, like restraining order bad. We've healed through a lot of that. It's been my personal, some of my personal work, right? And theirs too. Whew, we've met each other. We've met each other. But um, when I turned 40, it became very important to me to find my birth family. Not because um, I was trying to trade in the family I had, but because I wanted to know where my blood was, right? I've never looked like anybody. I wanted to know if I looked like somebody, right? So I met my birth mom, and uh, within a few weeks of putting out that letter, I met my birth mom, and she is a left-wing, liberal, solidarity-seeking, um, political force of nature wrapped up in a five foot four, 119 pound package. <laughs> and in that moment, I was like, oh. <laughs> oh. And I was able to see some of the paperwork that she filled out uh, a few months before she had me and gave me up for adoption. And there's a part at the end of this, maybe 11 page you know, biological questionnaire. At the very, towards the very end, there was a question, and she wrote in her 18-year-old girl handwriting, the question was, is there anything that you wish for the adoptive family, for the adoptive parents? And she wrote these things. She said, I'd like it if it was a home that values dogs, right? I want my kid to grow up around dogs. She said, and I would like it and this was in 1971 that she filled this paperwork out. She said, I would like it if she was adopted by a family that did not discriminate. So I feel like this is some in my DNA, right? This is some in my DNA. And uh, 
So when I moved to Madison 10 years ago and I started hanging out here, I realized that this is like a bullshit town for black people. Hello. It is. <laughs> And I, all, you know, and I also realized as the map of our country changes colors based on cultural background, we have a whole new generation of kids who don't even feel like they fit within a single race, right? So what about these kids that feel raceless, right? Who feel like, well, my mom is this and my dad is this and I've got some family who doesn't even live in this country and I don't know who I am. You know, I don't know what I should identify with and that is the future of this country. That is the future of this country. So it has been on my heart for a long time. I feel like Madison has the potential, and I feel like it hasn't reached its potential for quite a while. And my commitment to this city is that I'm going to work hard to try to make it a place deserving of all of these monikers, which are also lagging indicators for this community. So I wrote this article, and uh, here were the two bits that I think, um, yeah, kind of shut some people down. So, uh, 40 years of crappy outcomes for black people didn't happen overnight. If you're north of 30 years old and have lived in Madison as an adult, it's happened on our watch, right? White people have a responsibility for this. And I think it's important for us to talk about that. And then I wrote this, I am complicit. I took that sentence out, I put it back in, I took it out, I put it back in, I took it out, I put it back in. 47 revisions, right? It's hard to say I'm complicit, right? But it's true. It's true. And guilt about that or shame about that doesn't get me far. And it doesn't get you far and it doesn't advance this conversation, right? We can admit it as Caucasians, we have been complicit, but we also have to recognize that being the majority population means that we have more blind spots than anyone else, right? So to be open, to be open, right? One of my Zen teachers, Gordon Green, Roshi Gordon Green, he did a talk a few weeks ago, and I'm gonna leave you with this. Uh, there is some ceremony in Zen tradition, right? And I've always known Gordon as a dude who wears blue jeans and like denim shirts and drives tractors around and builds crap on the space in Spring Green where the dojo is. You know, he works hard and he's a great man. So when I saw him do this teaching, it was the first time I had been in a retreat with him and he came in in his gorgeous robes and uh, we did the tea ceremony and he sat down cross-legged to do the teaching. And he started with this. We're sitting in this beautiful dojo that he and a team of people have crafted by hand from the hardwood timber on this land in Spring Green. This is heart and soul and DNA and life's work. He's sitting in this beautiful dojo. He's sitting to give the night's talk. He points to his chest and he said, this is the dojo. This is the dojo. So, for all of us, this, this, is where the work starts. Data's interesting. It may help us know what the coming spring is like, but if we don't do this work in this dojo, none of it matters. Are you in? Yeah. Thank you.